Good morning, everybody, and welcome to First Christian Church. You know, I know it's, uh, it's a crazy time still, and there's plenty to be afraid of and plenty of good reasons to be afraid. Uh, but uh, we here at First Christian are moving ahead and building new things, as you, as you see behind me. Uh, we're trying our best to move forward uh, into this new year, and, and we thank you for being a part of that with us, those of you who are watching here online and moving forward with us. So I pray that the peace of Christ would be with you and also with you. Welcome to First Christian Church, everybody. service where we share with one another our joys and concerns. Um, as always, we'd love for you to reach out to us. Uh, you're welcome to do so by direct message, messaging us on Facebook, or you can always reach us at pastor at fccpalestine.org. Uh, at this time, of course, there's a, there's a lot to pray for in the nation. I mean, we know uh, a, a lot of people who are, a lot of people who are sick, um, it seems like I hear about more and more of those uh, every day, um, and you certainly know people as well. Um, and that's kind of magnified across. Um, that's kind of magnified across uh, the the whole nation. Um, we're also uh, itching and ready to sort of get back to to life as normal, and uh, it's uh, stressed all of us out. And uh, and so. Uh, we continue to pray for all of you um, in, in, in that situation as well. Um, beyond those, uh, we know that there are things uh, all going on in our lives uh, that, cause us, uh, that cause us to stress, whether they be financial hardships or, um, or relationship hardships or just loneliness in general that we all sort of go through during these times of isolation. Um, and, and so we pray for those as well. So without further ado, would you go to the Lord with us in prayer? Gracious God, we come to you as a people in need. We're, we're in need of you, for we have our fears and our worries and our anxieties. They plague us, O Lord. Even while we are plagued by what is quite literally a plague, that we have lost many brothers and sisters to. And so, Lord, we ask for the courage 
that the Israelites lost and had to find when they were wandering in the wilderness. The, the courage of knowing that you are with us no matter what we go through. The courage of knowing that you will see us through and that you will see things to their end and that you can turn things in a positive direction even when it seems like all hope is lost, O oh Lord. Show us that hope. Lord, we also need to give you thanks because many of our worries seem quite trivial in the face of the many miracles we have witnessed during this time as well. The great acts of wonder and kindness and beauty that we see springing up all before us. And so God, we say thank you. For you are a God who hears prayers and we know that you are with us because you have heard our cry and you will answer us again. So come, O oh Lord, in all your power. Come, O oh Lord, in all your strength. Drive away the shadows of death and fear and sickness. For you are the light of the world. Encourage us and strengthen us for what's ahead. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm glory bound, I'm on my way. I know I'll find sweet peace of mind, some happy day. I'm glory bound, and I can see. The promised land from where I stand is heavenly. I'm glory bound. I'm glory bound. I'll shout and sing. You just can't wait to see the King. To see the King. I'm glory bound. I'm heaven sure. I should have frowned on when I crowned forevermore. I've got my heart, I've got my wings, I've got a shore house full of heavenly things. And when I hear a hallelujah, hear a trumpet sound, you better let me buy a moment. Won't be hanging around my glory bound, my glory bound, my body bound. I'm gonna fly, 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 I'm gonna fly. And on that day, I'm gonna shout, I'm gonna shine, I'm gonna leave this world behind, I'm on my way. Our scripture reading this week comes from Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly and said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who explored the lands, tore their clothes. And they said to the Israelite, to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. 
Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. And then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting before all the Israelites. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. Let us pray. O God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O God, you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray that my words, O God, would not only be mine, but yours. Amen. You know, it occurs to me, particularly during this time, how much of our behavior is motivated by fear. And some of our fears, of course, um, are, are well and good because they protect us and keep us safe. Um, but a lot of the times our fears keep us from living the lives that we were meant to live. You know, I, I, I recall a story about a, a, a young woman who, uh, who was a non-practicing Muslim, but she had moved, um, she had moved from Saudi Arabia to the United States uh, and was a new doctor there. Uh, and she was, she was uh, practicing in New York City. And she came out of a parking garage uh, at night to go to her car. And, and, and a group of Hasidic Jews walked out of their meeting place, w- which shared a parking garage uh, w- with, uh, with where this woman was going, this young Muslim woman was going. And, and if you've never seen Hasidic Jews before, or the Hasidim, uh, you know, a, a, as they call themselves, they, they wear, uh, they wear uh, black garments. Uh, the men wear these, like, black suits, and they wear hats, and they have the, ha, have the curls. And um, she remembered in that moment at night alone in a parking garage with a group of Hasidic Jews how her grandmother had told her that Jews steal children at night and drink their blood. That's what she had, basically that Jews were vampires. That's what her grandmother had told her about Jews. Uh, Because at that time, neither her grandmother nor her had ever met Jews before. Of course, this young woman, as she lived in New York, had met quite a few Jews and had friends who were, who were Jews, both practicing and, and, and non-practicing, and, uh, and of course realized that Jews are not vampires, and that was ridiculous. Whatever. But in that single moment, when she first saw that group of Hasidic Jews walk into a, an empty parking garage, she had a moment of fear, a chill up her spine that somehow these, these Jews were going to fly away and steal her and drink her blood until she realized that that, was, that that was quite ridiculous. But a lot of our fears, in fact, are founded on utter nonsense and are completely ridiculous. Did you know that, and this is 2016, so you, it's got to be even worse now, that in 2016... That fear in the United States, they started measuring fear in the United States in the 80s. Okay, so they would call people and ask them, like, how afraid are you of, you know, how, you, how afraid of you are of terrorist attacks? How afraid of you, how afraid are you of your neighbors? How afraid are you of theft? How afraid are you of this and that and that? Um, and they would, they would ask people and, and, and they would answer. And so they started keeping tabs in, in the United States in the 80s uh, of how afraid people, uh, how afraid people are. Um, and it spiked, fear spiked in the United States on September 11th, 2001, which is completely understandable, right? Because... Uh, we had just, our country had just been attacked by a group of terrorists in a, in a very terrible way. And, you know, over 3,000 people lost their lives uh, in, in those attacks. And we all remember where we were on that day. But we also didn't know if there were more attacks coming. We, we didn't know. Um, we, we didn't know if there was some, you know, greater plot um, to, to attack us. Um, or what our lives would be like at that time. And so people were uh, incredibly, incredibly afraid. 
But in the year 2016, they were still doing that inventory. And for some reason, in the year 2016, people were just as afraid as they were on September 11th, 2001. There was no major terrorist attacks. We weren't in any escalating war. Why, why were people so afraid? Why? They were just as afraid in 2016 as they were on September 11th, 2001, when we were quite literally physically attacked by a foreign terrorist force. That doesn't make any sense, does it? And I can only assume, you know, that was four years ago. I can only assume that we are at least as afraid, as we, at the very least, as afraid as we were in 2001. But I assume we are probably more afraid than we were in 2016. Because, you know, there's a pandemic, we're all afraid, many of us are afraid to get out. I can only assume we're more afraid. Why are we so afraid? But we are. We're terrified. We're terrified. You know, the... In the, in the scripture I read today, it was from Numbers, and what God, what, what, uh, it, it's, it, in Numbers is this time when the Israelites have fled Egypt, and they're wandering through the wilderness, and, you know, the interesting thing is, when you look at the map of, of where they're going, it's not exactly a lot of space to cover, and we're told that they were lost for 40 years, you know, wandering this wilderness. And it's not that much to cover. They were spectacularly lost. Um, because when you look at trade routes that were known trade routes of where people went from traders regularly traveled between Egypt and what we would soon call the Holy Land or the land of Canaan, the promised land as you were. It's a straight line. You can literally travel in a straight line and not cross any rivers or anything like that straight to Canaan. And the Israelites didn't go in a straight line. They wandered all around for 40 years. And before that period, okay, before that period of 40 years was up, they actually got there. If you're reading your story, if you're reading through the Bible in 180 days like, like we are, they actually arrived at the Holy Land close enough that they, that they elect 12 spies. They, they elect 12 spies. And those spies go into the Holy Land, which, which means if you're following the story and what it means, they know where they are. They know where the Holy Land is. It's not some mystery. They get there. They arrived. And Moses tells these 12 guys, you know, go in, scout out the land, see who lives there. Find out, you know... If it's a good place to live, that kind of stuff, God has promised us that we're going to live in this land. And so, you know, kind of just scout it out for us. And those 12 guys that go into the land, they scout it out. And they see that there's a lot of people that live in Canaan already. There's, there's Hittites and Perizzites and Jebusites. They all live there and a lot of them have walled cities. They also find it, it says they find grapes as big as pomegranates, like big old grapes. 
then they're so big they have to carry them they, they have to get a stick and tie the grapes to the uh tie the grapes to to this stick and like hold it on their shoulders and carry it back like that's how big these grapes are now if you know anything about uh, a- ancient symbolism grapes are always a symbol of god's blessing and so grapes are a way and it's like land of milk and honey all these things are sweet things that you can make good food out of you know honey was the only form almost the only form of sweetener that these people had Um, Milk, of course, is a very uh, nutritious um, food and uh, milk and honey and grapes. Of course, you can make wine out of them and wine represents the blessing of God. And so so it's just this blessed, wonderful land. The problem is there's these big groups of people there that we think aren't going to that we think aren't going to to like us uh, and will probably want to kill us. And they're big. And so. They get back, those spies get back to the land and they're carrying these grapes and Moses said, hey everybody, gather around, the spies are going to tell us what they found, you know. And the spies said, you know, look at this land, it's so, it's so plentiful and there's so much to eat there and it's, it's got giant grapes and it's going to be wonderful to go there. Some of them say that. And the other ones say, but there's these other people there, and they're huge. And they they say this, they're so big that we look like grasshoppers to them. And they'll just crush us and, and devour us. We won't stand a chance against these people. And they have walls. There's like no way that we'll ever that we'll ever get there or get in there. We should just turn around. And we're going to all die. So Joshua and Caleb are the ones that are saying, oh, no, look, it's milk and honey and grapes. And then all there's 10 other people, though, that are saying, we're all going to die. It's terrible. It's awful. There's nothing we can do. And so what I read you is when the whole assembly hears that and responds to it, and they start wailing and weeping and they say, oh, no, we're all going to die. We should just turn back around and go back to Egypt or just wander around into the wilderness until we die. And you heard Joshua and Caleb stand up before them, which took quite a bit of courage. It takes courage to speak in front of people that don't agree with you, particularly when they are afraid, because people who are afraid are not rational. It's a trick of the human brain. People who are afraid are not rational. And uh, they stand up in front of them and they say, Look, we've been told that God is on our side and God will deliver us that land that we'll be able to go in there and we'll find a place And, and we'll win and we'll get there because God's going to be with us. We trust, we trust that God is, is, is going to be with us. And the people, because they're not rational, they pick up stones to, to try to stone Joshua and Caleb just for talking to them. And the only reason Joshua and Caleb are saved from being stoned to death and I don't mean by smoking pot, by the way. I mean, you throw rocks at people till they die. Um, that's stoning. The, the, the cloud of God's presence comes down on the tent and the people sort of back off, you know. Because, you know, Josh and Caleb have said, God is going to be with us. And God always shows up in a cloud uh, in this story. And so the, the cloud comes down and, and God shows up and, you know, and everybody everybody backs off. But they were afraid. And so what you find out is actually, you know, in their journey, the Israelites found the Holy Land pretty early. They just turned around. You know? They just turned around because, you know, they were afraid. And, I, you know, I wonder how much of our lives we've spent wondering. 
around metaphorically or, or just because we were afraid. You know, you, you, you hear about couples that, you know, never, uh, never got married because they were afraid to tell each other that they loved each other. You know, for this reason or, or, or for that reason. Or, you know, you hear about the person who, um, who uh, turned down the new job because they were afraid that they didn't have what it takes to do it. When somebody had told them before that they, that they were indeed qualified. You know, today, uh, we're, uh, many of us are afraid, and, and not completely without reason, uh, to leave our houses. You know, because we'll, we'll get sick. And then, uh, m- most of us are, are just like the Israelites. We're so afraid of other people. Because there's a group of people, particularly with the pandemic, and this is kind of how it breaks down. There are like two groups of, of broad groups of people. There are people who are really afraid of the, of the coronavirus, and legitimately so, legit, you know, afraid of the coronavirus, um, that they don't want to get out. And then there are people who are so afraid that some big entity like the government will take control of their lives that they won't follow government instructions like wearing a mask and things like that when, when they go out. And so both groups, though, are behaving out of fear. And so then they are also afraid of each other. Just like the people in the, just like the people in the Holy Land were afraid of each other. And it makes our lives so much more difficult because we, we are afraid of each other. And so like if you're a person who, you know, uh, believes in science and, and you, and you want to wear a mask and do all that stuff, you're af- one afraid of catching the virus, but you're also afraid of people who are more likely to spread the virus because they are uh, b- b- because they're not following those protocol. And if you're a person who doesn't believe in all that stuff, then if you're a person who doesn't believe all that stuff, then you're afraid that some like big government is going to take over and like control your life because uh, because you have to wear a mask. Like your you, like your rights are infringed upon, and if and it's a slippery slope. If your rights are infringed upon so much, they'll be infringed upon more and more and more, you know, on down the line until you have no rights, you know, whatsoever. And so we're all afraid of something and it keeps us from being able to, it keeps us from being able to relate to one another. And you know, physiologically, fear does this thing to you because fear is useful, you know, for, for keeping us alive. It's useful. I mean, that's why we have it. That's why we're af- afraid of certain stuff. You know, why are people afraid of snakes, and spiders? Some people are irrationally so. But those things can be poisonous. And so we developed a fear about that early on because the people who weren't afraid of snakes and spiders died because they got bit by snakes and spiders. And people who see a snake and be like, I ain't going near that thing, didn't die because they didn't get bit by a snake. You know, certain people learn to build walls early on, you know, because they say, oh, if we don't build a wall, we're going to get eaten by a tiger. And they built a wall, they get eaten by tigers. That was a useful application of fear. You know, it's useful to protect yourself and and be safe and not walk around like there's nothing wrong ever in the world. But the same people, but but the same instinct that makes us want to build walls and stay safe and all of those things can go so far 
that it, you know, it shuts down, fear shuts down the logical part of your brain because it's about running or fighting, running or fighting. And fear either makes you fight or run. That's, that's the only two options you have. You don't have time to think about it because like if your life really is in danger and someone really is trying to hurt you, you don't have time to reason with them or talk about it or think about your options. You got to run or you got to fight, period. That's it. It's urgent. It must be done now. And so it makes us less logical. The thing is, is today, we're all just swimming in this, you know, soup of fear. We're just swimming in this soup of fear, and we're so afraid all the time that, like, when the pandemic happened, we just, like, didn't have much more room to be afraid. We were already on maximum fear levels, as, as the data I, I pointed to earlier showed. We were already afraid of each other. And then it just spiked things through the roof and makes them even worse. We were already afraid of things, and now our fears about other people can literally potentially kill you if you contract a virus from them. And so in some ways, it was like fears being realized. And, you know, we, we watch the news all the time, and... Uh, one, one woman who was from, uh, who was from uh, Europe came over to the United States and she started watching our news. And she's, this is what she called our news. She said, our new, the, the news in the United States was tragedy pornography. It was like people who really want to hear about every tragedy and every bad thing all the time. And that's all Americans watched. And it was no wonder Americans were so afraid. And I'm like, well, she's got a point. Maybe that's why our fear levels were higher in 2016 than they had been since 2001 when we were attacked by terrorists. And the thing is, there, it's not like there's no reason to be afraid and all of our fears are irrational. Many of our fears are founded, are well-founded, in fact. But notice Joshua and Caleb. They don't say you don't need to be afraid at all. They say it in the old-fashioned way, fear not, for God will be with you. And that's what the Israelites needed to give them courage, those ones that were, those ones that were uh, going to go and find the promised land, that were going to cross over. It's not like you'll ever be absent of fear. It's not like it's not like fear will ever completely go away because to be not afraid of anything at all would be to be a sociopath. And so we don't have to dispel fear completely from our lives, and we shouldn't because it's useful. But knowing that God is there and God is with us can give us courage to do what we need to do in life, to do what needs to be done, to reach out to one another, to listen to one another, to go where we need to go and do what we need to do in order to live fruitful and productive lives despite the fears that we have. And there's a way to do that safely. There's a way to balance our safety and our other needs one to another. We don't have to be so paralyzed. But what I do know is that the worst decisions I've ever made in my life have been made out of fear. And they're usually when I'm not much of a fighter. I'm a coward. That's just how I am. 
I wish I, w- I wish I could tell you, like stand up here and say I'm like a brave warrior. I'm just not. I'm more likely to run than I am to fight. And so I've run away from a lot of things in my life that, that, that could have gone better. You know, when there are sometimes when like a conversation, one conversation is what you need to, to, to uh, make things right with a person that I haven't called because I was afraid of being rejected or afraid of what that person would say or afraid to have a confrontation when I needed, when a confrontation was needed and it kept me from doing the right thing or afraid of achieving more than I knew I could have because I was afraid I would fail. And I wonder how many of us, how many of you watching and worshiping with us are like me as well particularly in this time where we've missed so many opportunities to find the promised land, to find the land flowing with milk and honey that we know we all could live in because we were afraid. I know I have, and I wonder if you do too, And so I'm wondering if if you will with me, as we walk into this new year, if you can walk through it knowing that God is with us. I'm not saying don't be safe or throw precautions to the wind. It's not what I'm saying at all. But we could reach out more to one another, particularly people that don't agree with us. We could get out of our shells more. Many of us could. We could listen to each other better. We could do all that, even though we're afraid. And there's a way to do all the things that we need to do safely. If we're willing to not be so afraid of each other. And if we're willing to be there for one another. Because if we're going to have a successful 2021. Then we're going to have to figure out a way not to be so afraid. And so in your mind's eye, perhaps with me, when you are afraid, you can invoke the presence of the Lord. See that cloud in your mind's eye and know that there is a God who lives within you, even though you're afraid and goes with you, even though you're afraid. Because the most triumphant moments in my life or when I was terrified. But I said what needed to be said. And I went where I needed to go. And I did what I needed to do. Even though I could hardly walk, I was so scared. But I did it. Because I knew that Christ went with me. You know, there are times that I'm called to go into a hospital room and I know someone is dying or to pray for someone in a very difficult situation after they've lost someone they love or some terrible tragedy has happened. And Do you know that terrifies me? Because, you know, I'm worried I'm going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or they're not going to want me there and tell me to leave or something like that. But every time when I get to that place, you know, I usually drive there and stop my car. And I think, you know, God, 
It's you who have called me to this place, and it's you who have called me to be a, a presence in the world for you, to be a light in the world for you, to be an example of your love. So please help me put aside my fears. Please help me to put aside myself and become more like you so that it's you, O Christ, who goes into this place and not me. And I pray that. And every time, even if it's a terrible tragedy and it doesn't, you know, turn out as what I'd imagined or hoped, I'm glad I did. I've never regretted that. Can we live beyond our fears this year? Can we rise beyond them? I hope so. It is the good news of the gospel. It is the word of the Lord that God is with us. Even though we're all afraid. And God goes with us. Even when we're afraid. Amen. We've reached a time in our service where we share with one another in the Lord's Supper. So if you'll get your elements. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he first took the bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said... This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. For as often as you eat my body and you drink my blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. It is in that rich and great tradition of Jesus Christ in the Last Supper with his disciples that we are gathered here today. As Christians have gathered around this table for over 2,000 years in their homes and in churches alike. Would you pray with me, please? God, we pray that these elements, this bread and this cup, would be your body and your blood to us. That as your body infuses ours, that we may have your strength. That as this cup flows through our veins, that we may feel your spirit flow through us and that we may have your courage to go and be and do what you have called us to do. God, bless these elements as we partake. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Thanks be to God. Amen. Just a closer walk.
Thanks everybody for joining us. We are so glad that you chose uh, to worship with us today online. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for wandering with us. Um, I know it feels like we're all like the Israelites wandering around in the wilderness, uh, that we've all been lost for so long. Um, but it, it's time to step into the promised land. Uh, this year will be the time to step into the promised land, and that's why we're building new things, making new plans, building new hopes, and we hope that you'll continue to stay with us and continue to, to go on this journey with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make His face to shine upon you and give you peace and grace both now and in the life to come. Amen. Thanks for joining us, everybody.